um, New Zealand music extravaganza sort of thing. I don't know. Maybe next year we come back to that or something. Yeah, I guess so. It'd be it's it'd be hard to tie our schedules together, and we'll yeah. see. I mean, Shane's pretty well. Yeah, I guess resist over media saturation. I guess so, right. Yeah. So we can hear us in our cans, which means we are live with Martin Phillips from The Chills. Uh, kia ora and good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Doing well? Yeah, pretty good, actually. Things are moving along pretty uh, at quite a pace at the moment. Yeah, yeah. thanks for coming in. Uh, now, you, you are, you know, Dunedin icon, Dunedin sound. There's, all, it, there's a million and one reasons to have you in for a chat. But one of the main reasons we have you in at the moment, obviously, is because we have the DVD release of the film. Uh, the film, because we had Julia Parnell in, the director, May. Oh, because it was for New Zealand Music Month. Yeah. So that was when the film actually came out. And now the um, DVD has come out a couple of weeks ago, available at all good locations, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, I had a look today because when Julia came in, I had a screener. And I was going to watch the screener again because it's good to be, you know, to. and unfortunately the link had been taken down. But I also noticed on Google Play, and some other places you could just rent it for, I think it was seven bucks or something to rent it if you wanted to watch it overnight. So oh, rentable, good. purchasable. Um, yeah. What's it like being kind of the main character of a documentary? It's, it's like being, I mean, you're a front man for the band. So you've always kind of been that out the front person. But as, as the kind of your, your life laid bare on, I was going to say cellul- celluloid, it's not that anymore, but digital version of it. Is that a strange feeling? It, it really was. I mean, uh, the movie successfully ties together a bunch of themes and the, and the chill story is really only one of them. So yeah. so the large chunk really is my kind of weird life story, in particular the health issues. So uh, I avoided being involved too much with the actual, you know, production of the movie and left it to them to decide what you know how to tell the story that's their that's when, their role when you say that you avoided do you mean like the final edit what final cuts decision making because obviously you needed to be involved a lot with the filming yeah well there were, there's hours and hours of uh, probably hundreds of hours of footage that was shot for it including interviews but yeah. um beyond that how they chose to tell a story what they were asking other band members and what was covered elsewhere that wasn't really my role and so to see it uh, in the end looking really good, I think they made a, quite a special movie. So, and that's gener- that's been the response is that it's it's certainly more than a normal rock documentary, and uh, it's pretty satisfying. I think my only problem now is that having thought, uh, particularly during the sort of early part of the movie, that I might be dead within a year or something, and now I'm not. <laughs> I kind of gave away quite a lot of stuff about my, you know, sort of. It is very very frank and. Uh, now I've got to live with that. So. Well, you did a mass clear out, didn't you? I started on it. Yeah. You, mean, you mean physically with yeah, the yeah. My stuff? Yeah, well, that's still underway because the pressure's off a bit now. You know, I'm a spoiler, but I do survive. So, um, <laughs> so hang on. I wasn't. So just so we're clear, you did not die. No, that's right. You're yeah. still here. I'm still here. Phew. So uh, <laughs> it was, I started on what seemed to be a real urgent uh, discarding of all my collections and stuff and that process is ongoing but we realized it was going to be a, a massive job so I'm, you know sort of slow down a bit yeah as the pressure uh has sort of shifted back onto my career basically so the stuff like you've got a it's almost like your house is somewhat of a collection of what 40 years in the business 35 years in the business all sorts of stuff and then collections on the top are, are you i'm just trying to think of the name there's a um theologian based out of Auckland who does a lot of commentary on news whose name eludes me right now um, he had to have his house repiled because of the number of books he had is that the kind of standard that you know the kind of level of collecting you had in your place uh, okay I, I think I've, I've accepted that I am obsessive but um, <laughs> I don't think I'm that obsessive so yeah. uh, in fact I haven't gotten with a new vinyl buying craze again i've still got probably three thousand vinyl left having whittled the collection down to probably a third of what it was yeah but i've also had to carry that around six shifts of houses and i'm I'm just not doing that again yeah so i'm quite happy with them i still buy cds and occasionally and uh and that's good but no I've, i've slowed down and basically i'm still giving stuff away as i find the right right person for the right object or right yeah now this is one of the um uh, one of the hiccups of doing a live stream broadcast but jace um could you there's people waiting outside our door looking like they want to come into our room 
Could you maybe put us on a wide shot and go and have a chat with them and we'll keep on talking? <clears throat> Live stream broadcast at their yep. best. So are you someone who, like, you've got items to give away and you think, you meet someone and you go, oh, this is theirs. It's, a, it's a, almost a spiritual thing. This feels like it's the right person to give to. Or is it more that they were involved somewhere and that was what was going on? Oh, well, kind of a mixture because um, if I find somebody who's actively archiving um, to a degree more than I can, than I can commit to now, I'll certainly be looking at, you know, a, a lot of my collections will be going to either the Hocken or Toitu or Alexander right. Turnbull's interested, that kind of thing. That's, that's a longer process because we've got to really look at the legality of that and ongoing access to the public, that kind of thing. But, for example, a friend of mine on Facebook the other day was talking about Morris and Dark, you know, where the wild things are. And, yeah. and, the, um, and I suddenly realised I had a book of Morris and Dark posters for things like book days in America wow. and stuff. And, and I thought, okay, am I, you know, I love this, but am I ever going to really uh, look at it again or frame the individual, individual pictures, which is what I thought when I picked it up maybe 25 years ago. Yep. So no, there's, there's a perfect person to hand it on to. So it's, so it's almost like, um, you know, there's a belief amongst some cultures that we don't own the land, we're just, um, we're just looking after it until the next... It feels like that's what you're saying. This is something that that someone in a better position or who can look after it better, it's good to pass that down the line. So it gets looked after. Yeah, well, one of the themes in the movie that came up was I, I seriously thought I was going to have a family and kids to pass my collections onto, and that hasn't happened. So I kind of left with all the stuff, um, you know, including a, a very good overview of pop culture. Uh, you sort of, you know, I guess more populist cinema um, yeah. although there's a you know good degree of kind of like art house and stuff in there as well but now that everyone's sort of shifted on to uh you know to sort of streaming and um you know viewing online it's kind of like it's an awful lot of clutter that nobody really wants to take on although i'm mourning people and it's coming true you know this uh i can look through my collection there's a lot of stuff which is just not not available now any, anywhere right and particularly with the old VH, vhs that i've got a couple of hundred left too um, many of those titles will never be available in right. this, um, they never even made DVD let alone um, you know being available anywhere else does your collection collections does it have a, a monetary value like if you were like okay let's be a little bit dark and so let's say that you had that 30% chance at the start of the movie that they gave you to passing away let's just say that that had a family and you had a passed away and in your will um, there was all these things left over. Could someone have put them to auction and made a couple of hundred K or is it non-financially kind of uh, rewarding collections? Oh, it's a real mixture. I mean, there are particularly watching now the prices go up on pretty uh, pretty mundane sort of items, really, in a lot of way in, in vinyl. Um, my collection is very valuable in that sense, but there's also a lot of one-offs which belong in... Uh, you know, one of the serious New Zealand archives, uh, just so there is a copy in the archive. Um, yeah, they, and just sort of things like clippings and posts and stuff, which which maybe of bands that nobody's really looking for, you know, items of, but but it may be the only surviving artefact of of a band that existed for a month in Dunedin or something. So, <laughs> you know, so it sounds like a lot of these things that's moving on to our actual. Um official repositories museums and places that will will house them for in perpetuity sort of thing i think so i mean do you have one do you have one that you kind of go one that you think about where you gave it and that one thing that you kind of go i'm so glad that this group has now got it anything come to mind uh well not yet because the process isn't kind of uh. isn't quite done yet um, is there anything you're struggling to give away is there anything you think how will i ever let someone else be the you know the, the the looker after it of that. Well, yeah, that, that's a problem because I'm finding I'm sort of hanging on to stuff. Yeah, I might watch this again one day. I might listen to that again one day. And um, of course, that's somebody pointed out. Even my DVDs to be watched pile is more than somebody could watch in their life now. <laughs> so, um, so what you've bought DVDs and haven't watched them yet? Oh yeah, my my, my hallway is lined with the A to Z of ones that are yet to be watched. Wow. Um, although some of that is replacing uh, VHS or I've found the deluxe edition with a bonus disc of how they made the movie, that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, and being sort of, you know, 
obsessive i have to watch those before i can file them away and the watch. does it annoy you when you have uh, put time effort energy money whatever into finding a film and then all of a sudden you see it's on netflix did that bug you because that happened to me the other day um jermaine clement's got a movie out where he is a single dad and an architect of twin girls in new york so he's playing a kiwi but he's in New York, and I saw it on, I think I saw it on iTunes and I bought it, because I, I, I like the theme, I think the following month it was on Netflix. And I could have watched it for nothing, more nothing for it's kind a of subscription. The rule with, I've found it's kind of the rule with with iTunes. The, the week you buy the movie on iTunes, unless it's a brand new release, it's uh, it'll go on Netflix the next <laughs> week. I've had to have it made like five times in the last year. Yeah, Yeah. well, I, I don't actually watch a lot of Netflix, because... For one, I'm my because you've got ten thousand movies to get through. Well, that, that too, <laughs> but um, my earning my earnings are so sort of you know fluctuate so much. Mm. I've, I've never been able to sort of commit to um, saying I can afford to pay a monthly fee for anything really. So I've only just had my first credit card for the last two or three years, even. Wow. Um, so that's but that's part of only the artifact. Plus, also uh, one example, a, f- a friend of mine. Um, had bought the original Roger Moore Saint TV series box sets and of course they come online it's like great you know on Netflix or somewhere um, sold the box sets within a year they've been taken down again and now they're gone yeah you know, and they won't be coming up again anywhere else so well very unlikely so you know <laughs> it's these companies are warning everybody they're not they're not your archive they're not yeah, your yeah, library yeah. you know they're we're a functioning business we can't afford the storage for all the stuff so um but most people are quite happy to kind of watch the amazing new TV which is coming out all the time, the amazing movies. Um, somebody pointed out, I think it was like 1950, well, around the Academy Award movies, it was a really great year, and there's only like one of them available at the moment of the sort of eight nominated movies. Right. Um, which is a really pretty... That's getting quite serious in terms of you know maintaining an overview of artistic culture I guess you think about it as well from the musical side of things I mean everything's moving to Spotify in fact am I right that Apple Music is shutting down and they're going to a streaming service as well so iTunes is shutting down yeah iTunes is shutting down as far as as far as I'm going to Apple Music but yeah basically yeah you're not going to be able to buy music through Apple you just have to pay a subscription and stream it so very quickly you're getting to a model in music where you're not going to be able to buy any music that everything is going to be streamed, belong to someone else, and you're paying for the service. And it might be a nice thing though, because it might actually be, it might cause the resurgence in people buying CDs again. Because or maybe. if you want to make sure that you aren't at the mercy of the streaming service for pulling it down and taking it back up again, if you want to be able to know that tomorrow you can listen to your favorite band, yeah, yeah, then, yeah. I mean, then you'll buy the CD. Because I think I think the Beatles might be on Spotify now, but they certainly weren't for a long time. Yeah. So if you couldn't have gone out and bought it, or if you couldn't have purchased it, then much like these movies. Yeah, well, that would, would have been temporarily, if not permanently, lost until someone then put it up. There was there was the like um, thing two weeks ago. I think everybody in the world rejoiced. There was a Tool fan because Tool's back catalogue was finally available on um, on Spotify. It was like a massive big to do. It was released and everybody went nuts because you know Tool's got a lot of fans and they finally had their available their music available on a streaming service and they hadn't. So people were just rejoicing in the hills. Apparently, also it's. It's things like the, um, the 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 remix or the extended version or the bonus tracks and the the rear outtakes. That stuff doesn't tend to sort of end up out there. It's it's the yeah. Um, I, 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 I there was a um, I'm just the story for like, I, one of my favorite bands. The B side version that they released of a song before they re released it um, like fully. Um, I I prefer a thousand times more. Um, the drums are nicer. It's a little more organic. And so I think that, the, and so the B-side version is the one I prefer, and it's the one I, I, I think on my iTunes library, I deleted the one from the album and replaced it with the B-side because yeah. that's the one I prefer. And if, yeah, on iTunes and um, Spotify, you don't get that one. So, so yeah. um, I think one of my favourite songs of all times, JG, go to, go to um, YouTube, I think it's called The Weather Episode, but if you look up Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Crowded House, um, Dre and Snoop remixed Weather With You. Yeah. And they obviously turned into their own they wrapped over the top and I, I love it but I as you think I don't think that's available anywhere I don't even know how it got on YouTube um, but it's on YouTube so every now and again what I think about it, like right now all I want to do is hear a little bit of it and maybe if we can Jace will find that for us and oh I'm getting a bit of a double feedback stand by it's just going to be let me turn off the music from the other channels 
So then obviously I'm remixing it. Yeah, you I've know, heard, I've heard this. It's very yeah. cool, and it's just you can't, you can't. I don't. Where would you? Get? I'm, I'm ninety percent sure that's not on Spotify, but you yeah, particularly with, um, you know, all the stuff in this, you get into the legality, the copyright issues of yeah. perhaps the company was okay to let this happen as a weird B side of a twelve inch remix release. Yeah, never expecting that it was going to become uh, digitized somewhere down the line and then forever available to anybody. So some of the real special stuff will just be caught up in a mire of lawyers at the moment about, you know, what's what's going to happen. And, it'll, yeah, presumably will ne- we'll not be allowed to see the light of day. Well, the other thing is the way that the model has changed as well. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not involved in that industry, but I, I read a lot and, and I see a lot of people talking, big artists talking about the money and the hours in touring, not in the album sales per se. And, I mean, I know that we don't want to put out too many sp- too many spoilers for your documentary because it's still fresh off the press but there was a really i mean i i laughed you probably don't laugh when it comes in but when the royalty check comes in um and what (laughs) and and how that pans out um and i guess it's different now because you're on spot i had a friend of mine who makes music in nashville and i think i've told this story before he said you know when you go away this weekend put one of our songs on loop on Spotify, and he says, by the time we get back, I'll nearly have enough for a cup of coffee. You know, so, so playing twenty four hours a day for three days that might give him a couple of bucks, yeah, sort of thing. And and I wonder if people like yourself and groups like yourself through that, uh, not that you're obsolete, you're well, I was going to say through that era, you're in this era as well. But when we were talking about the focus of the documentary, the music that you've made, it was a different financial model to what it is today. So I wonder if there is a group of you know, artists like yourself who are now suffering that they're still trying to kind of grasp back finances and stuff from then, but they've been moved into a new model, which basically kind of means they'll probably never grasp those financial rewards back. Yeah, that's that's very much the case. We're we're in uh, we're really involved with discussions at the moment about what what to do because we had a uh, by any standards a really successful American tour early this year. But um, it costs an awful lot of money, yeah. and most of the dialogue about the stuff is northern hemisphere dialogue. You know, people saying, "Hey, look, just get out on the road and tour." There's, you know, that's that's your market. Well, it's fine if you're northern hemisphere, and in the case of the chills, it's like a twenty twenty five thousand bucks to get us there. You know, just right. airfares, accommodation, paying people's jobs. So your first ten shows pay for just getting across there, let alone anything else. Um, yeah, it's it's even worse than that. There are so many other costs with, um, <coughs> excuse me, immigration and uh, that sort of thing. Oh, this just choked on something. Sorry, <laughs> <coughs> the humbug. Yeah, well, because even like uh, um, from from my filmmaking knowledge, uh, if you take any equipment with you, you have to um, get what's called a a, um, a carnet, which says that Car- carne, like, carne, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ballot, ballet. Um, to say that I own this thing, I'm taking it into the country yeah. to bring it back out again. And so you can't pay, swap all your lenses out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you've got to pay like a ridiculous. You've got to for, for certain items in certain countries, you've got to pay almost 100 percent of the value of the item to a um, as a bond, and then you get it back. So yeah. you've got to have if you're taking twenty thousand dollars with gear, you've got to have to pay somebody twenty thousand dollars, and then hope that you get that back at the end. Sort of thing. It's ridiculous. That sort of stuff. Yeah, that doesn't always happen now, but um, it's been great with the EU because. In the 80s, when we were touring, we had to do that through every country in Europe, and sometimes right. you couldn't even find the border crossing, let alone right. the way the, uh, the office to get your paper signed in and out. And you could not leave a country that you had not entered with your carne not signed in. So you were saying that you had a you know, fairly successful tour of America. So are you saying because we were talking about money, you didn't come away with that with Scorpions in the bank either? Oh no, not at all. So it was just absolutely touch and go, and. You know, you see even, even music fans online saying, oh, look, let's get over it. This is the new model. People are getting music cheap and you should be happy that it's getting out there. Well, no, from our point of view, nothing's changed. It still costs an awful lot to buy the equipment, yep. to, um, to record music. Sure, you can do it in a bedroom, but the the bulk of the kind of um, non-programmed recordings you he- you're hearing are still done in a, in a decent studio somewhere. It costs. It costs accommodation. All those costs are there. And all of a sudden... Yeah, your, your um, remuneration is is pretty much non-existent. So there's so how do you so how do you pay the bills? Like, have you got a mortgage and rates and all that kind of stuff? 
Uh, I've, yeah, I've been paying my first mortgage for the last few years. And so how do you how do you pay the bills? Where does that money come from? Well, obviously that's, that gets a bit gets a bit private. Cause okay, sure. But, but um, but it's it's very close, and that's with yeah royal, with royalties. And so, but well, I guess what I'm asking, without getting into your business, is that they come from your music? Is that where you pay your bills from? Oh yeah. And so that's enough to it's enough to pay your bills, but you're living as you just said without taking on a subscription. It still sounds like you're living sort of not, maybe not month to month, but certainly on the close to the bone. Uh, well, worse than that because I mean, the point is because I've still got um, I've cured of hep- hepatitis C, mm-hmm. but my liver is still you know the function on twenty percent. We're still finding out what that actually means, so I'm still on a sickness benefit. Okay, and without that, without that, I would not be able to pay my mortgage. Right, wow. So, um, yeah. So I think a lot of a lot of people I know are getting by by painting, selling paintings, just mm-hmm. sort of all sorts of desperate things. Um, yeah, it's. I've seen some fairly academic reports on how they see the change in the next twenty years when governments get involved and actually challenge the industry a bit, bit more. And also, remember, it's taken like thirty years to get where we are with people really thinking music is free. Mm-hmm. It'll take another generation for it to get back to where people valuing, valuing when you, it. When you say challenge the industry, what do you mean? Challenge well, it actually, in what way? Well, actually, saying. Um, I, yeah, I sort of write, writing into a law that there must be some sort of uh, uh, yeah better better payment structure for you know like any like any other kind of um, employment situation that that's not it's not enough to be paying people point zero 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 three mm. of a of a cent per whatever and making billions of it. I had a friend who worked in copyright in the UK. Um, I don't know if this eventually happened, but there was a, and I don't know how it would relate quite to music, but there was talk for a while in this office. This was like a, you know, an official copyright office in the UK, probably a government agency, about a piece of artwork, so a, a painting or a sculpture or a physical piece of artwork. Um, every time it was sold, the artist getting a kickback from that every single time. I mean, you think about that, you get the painting gets sold once and then they get their payment and that's it. But there was this idea floated that when you sell it, there is a royalty that goes back to the artist each time as well. Which I thought was interesting. It is. I, I really can't see how it could be uh, policed, but yeah. But you can understand why, um, within a hundred years, an artist may go from you know typically not selling anything during their life to their work being worth millions. Oh well, also the, num- the number that have, yeah they die penniless and yeah. then they're worth millions afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. And their and their family should should be getting something back from mm. the same as anybody else who's worked hard at a career, hoping to support their family. But you know, in terms of how that's it's going to be, what would be a fair scene. model? I mean, I'm thinking about New Zealand music scene. Um, you know, I know a few people who are doing fairly well in the New Zealand music scene, but. Not many of them seem to be surviving just off their music. They're doing a bit of teaching on the side, or they're writing um, radio jingles, on, so which is still their music, but not their um, recorded. You know, even people who have won Silver Scrolls and that still working, uh, doing jingles and stuff on the side to bring a bit more money in. Um, I mean, what is a fair model? Is, is it just because you know you have a five percent of the marketplace in New Zealand? That's not a lot of people, but of course, five percent of the marketplace in America. You're ginormous. Is it just purely a population issue, or is there a better way to do it? Um, obviously, the population and isolation here is a major factor. Uh, that's what I mean about you can you can be based on the northern hemisphere. Your market is right there. You just jump in a van. And yeah. you can go and you can go and earn that night. But um, yeah, it's 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 very different here. And I'm not. I, I've got no answers. I don't. I don't see. I know that if I was starting out now, I would certainly be looking at having to have a, um, a, a another career running alongside. Um, what kept you in Dunedin? Because also, even from the idea of population, it would seem to make financial sense. You know that you would. I mean, like silly, silly um, um, analogy, but the import boats typically stop in Auckland and Christchurch, where the bigger populations are so it costs them less money per unit to get into more people would make sense wouldn't it for a musician in this day and age if they wanted to be doing gigging and stuff to be in Auckland that's the biggest you know 1.5 million people yeah what kept you in Dunedin well actually it, historically it didn't I mean it, like the first four years of the chills were, in, were Dunedin based but mm. then then it was Auckland for like three or four years then London for about three or four Los Angeles 
back to back to Auckland for a number of years. So we did move around quite a lot. Um, and the time that I actually came back to New Zealand from, um, I guess, America, uh, I didn't realise I kind of get, I was going to get stuck here, you know, with the label kind of dropping dropping the band, Warner Brothers. So, um, so you know, we thought we were moving around, but keeping on top of those markets at the, at the time. Um, and now I'm in a position where uh, four of the five members of the band are based here with two of them with families um, and and they've all got jobs mm-hmm. so it's and it's also a great creative place to come back to and and cheap cost of living yeah. so you know you, you do balance it out it's a personally I find it a, you know it's my home um, it's my recharging place mm. but it only works so long as you are getting out and, and being stimulated by uh, I guess the much more fast moving kind of market and um, contemporary art sort of scene overseas at the same time and that's what was missing for so long for us was mm. just kind of unfortunately being stuck stuck here the it's um i guess part of the documentary tells the story but it'd be interesting to hear from you because um, like you say the the producers sort of had the narrative for the story not to say that it was inaccurate anyway but it would be interesting to hear from you i mean you think the chills um you know i'm a i'm a child of the 80s so I think the Chills and the Dudes and Dave Dobbin and, well, I'm going to say three in a row, Diddy Smash, or all of those. But, you know, the Finn Brothers and all these ones, they're all sort of, I mean, I had Greg Johnson in here all, several weeks ago. You guys all seem to be, that, they're your classmates. That's how it feels to me. Coming up, you know, as a teenager in the 80s sort of thing. Some of the other ones went off and did stuff, big international stuff. And I guess you look at the Tim Finns and stuff of this world now are, who are surviving quite comfortably off their royalties and their, and their work. Um, and you guys were international act, international label. What happened? What happened that that you're not sitting? Let's say we're in Dunedin, so let's say up in Māori Hill right now, on a in a big north facing flash place because you've got plenty of dosh in the bank. What went wrong? Well, it's it's complicated, but um, all the kind of band politics and members sort of leaving. Which stopped the you know stopped the kind of uh, momentum for a while. All that to one side, right at the very point that things were looking the best for the Chills around 1990, with uh, Submarine Bells, Heavenly Pop Hit, and mm. and um, in theory another six albums with Warner Brothers, was that the industry just absolutely uh, changed. I, you know, almost overnight, the digital revolution um, impacted like nobody had foreseen. You know. First of all, they tried to kind of hold off CDs, and and then within years it was like Napster, and, and it was just, it was all over. So we got caught in that where the major companies basically sliced the third of their bottom third of their roster off, and we were just at that kind of nearly crossing over thing. So um, and by that stage, we'd we'd been around for 12, 13 years or so, and you know the. Movie and music had moved on, um, rap and hip hop and Nirvana and Acid House and Britpop, all had been taking place or were already over. We were old news by then. It didn't matter what the quality of our stuff was. It was just like, you know, the you need to you needed to have ridden that wave. Or there wasn't going to be another one. So mm. then it's like a period of kind of like waiting around until you become legacy artists, you know, and respected elder statesmen, which is, <laughs> which is kind of what's what's happening now. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's that's really good. And we've got new Chills fans and we've got old ones who are coming along for a nostalgia hit and then going away realising actually the new stuff is really good too, which is what, you know, what they're telling us. You must have parents and kids coming along at the moment to get this sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, it is. Even, there's a strange, a lot of... um seven or eight year olds who, who oh. even seem to like the same songs it's quite strange so what is it about the world of music what I hear you saying and please correct me if I'm wrong I'm very much used to that um, is that you had a style that kind of went out of fashion a little bit but then there's other bands and I'm thinking you know of the U2s of this world who seem to evolve and move with the times and never go away did you guys change did you try in that path or did you say this is us you know, we need to wait for people to come back to us. Um, well, that's an odd one to compare. I mean, you two obviously were 
established financially enough to be able to experiment and try things. Yep. Plus, plus, they had the stability of one lineup. I mean, that's the point. You lose one member of the band, you may still have three or four others, but you are essentially a band that cannot play. You know, that's right. what people forget. So that's months gone. And the Chills lost years, literally years, with um, finding other members. So from my point of view, I believe that robbed us of the uh, ability to spend that special time not having to race to produce the next album, but just actually experimenting and seeing we could actually be doing doing this, you know. So if the original members had a hunger down and just gone, let's spend the next six months, 12 months, whatever, tutuing, who knows? Yeah, and, and also, you know, you, you look around what's going on, you think, I don't like that, I do like that. We don't want to do it like that. We can find a chills way of doing that. And, yep. you know, um, we've never really had the opportunity to do that ever. It's just, even now, um, with Ollie, our keyboardist being based in Wellington, we, we can only sort of get together for rehearsals for upcoming gigs. And it's um, it's becoming quite an issue for the next album because I'm not prepared to just kind of rush out another selection of songs, even if they're good quality songs, mm -hmm. because it's really imperative that we are seen to be moving forward. So, um, yeah, that's that's part of the big dialogue at the moment. There always seems to be a, a fair amount of change. Uh, yeah, may, maybe you two is the wrong ones to talk about because it's unfair, but there always seems to be a fair amount of change within bands. I remember um, there's a very good, one of my favourite documentaries, actually music-based, is Back and Forth, the uh, Foo Fighters documentary. Have you seen that one yet? No, I haven't seen that. Really worth seeing. And, they, and one of the things that's obvious is they show the story of going through the drummers until they end up with their, their, their current drummer. And um, it's pretty ugly. Um, and then when talking to Dave Grohl, he says, uh, what you guys don't aren't aware of is I was the fifth drummer for Nirvana. That just all happened before we became famous. Yeah. Whereas for Foo Fighters, obviously, he Grohl was already famous. And so they already had spotlight with all these changes. When, when you had the original guys or the original incarnations leaving... Was that sort of a natural progression? Oh, yeah, I understand why you're leaving. It's all, was it was it hard? Was it ugly? Was it was was it bad? Were there, were there Ill, Ill will and bad feelings? Um, the movies uncovered more, not quite ill will, but just um, more issues than I, I realised actually still existed. So, hearing yeah. the original members on the movie after it's been released, basically, you're saying you you saw stuff that you never knew. Um, yeah, some things. I mean, during the movie, I was asked to re respond to some, you know, um, some issues, and that was the first I realised about about misunderstandings mm. or or me just being oblivious to people's needs, all sorts of things. Um, remember, with the chills, the, the thing is, it wasn't like the one special band that then dispersed, and it's been filling ever since. It's yep. like there never was one constant band. You know, there was like bands that did certain recordings. Um, you know, and then three years later, the next famous recording will be a completely different band kind of is, thing. Is that so. a problem in the music world when there is a obvious leader and front man who seems to get... I mean, I, I guess it would appear to me a lot of the focus and attention that the back two, three, four members aren't seen by the public are so important, so maybe it's easier to change them out and it becomes... You know, I mean, like the, the documentary is called The Triumph and Tragedy of Martin Phillips... The chills, you know, so it's the chills, but it's still your story. So if you've got this, um, you know, charismatic, big, main front person, does that become harder to keep this unit together because maybe the people behind aren't seen as the uh, the same kind of equally, have the same kind of equal ownership to this band as the, the big dude up the front? Uh, yeah, very much, I think. And part of the problem is, well, there's a number of issues here. One... I'm more comfortable now with my role, but I have never been that kind of real charismatic person. I've been the songwriter and yep. the person who therefore needs to deliver uh, quite, a, quite idiosyncratic material. Um, but even now, the band, you know, 20, 20 years, 15 years, 10 years membership, people are still saying, oh, who's in the band now? Who've you? you know, it's just like, okay, fair enough. You know, we're not sort of up in the you know, on everybody's minds, but it's it's quite a kind of disturbing for them. Um, but I think the most difficult problem is that, I, that I'm not the dictator I could have been, in which case I could have just told all these people what to play. What I've always looked for is that band feel and band yeah. kind of communication. Um, 
the enthusiasm to chuck around ideas and you know really work as a unit but the acknowledgement that I'm the kind of overseer of the direction of my material so it's there, you know, there must be other bands like that but there aren't it's either one or the other more often you know it's either the, the, the main guy and everybody does exactly that or yeah. it's or it's a team effort do you think um, on reflection that maybe a stronger hand you taking more of a leadership role might have I mean it sounds to me like the best kind of way bands would work would be in a um, collaborative team thing but I guess equally if you've also got someone saying you need to do this you need, that might work as well taking a stronger hand might have been a better a better outcome uh, possibly although then we got we go to my my ignorance of how things actually work yeah, and course. how and um and very rudimentary musical knowledge whereas other people can say well, there are other ways of doing with this which are better um the trouble with the collaborative thing it, it's we all know the bands we love work, work well you know yep. it's just extraordinary to see bands that do that but i think more more often than not the other members have all got their favorite artists they're quite disparate range and you'll find somebody going off down uh trying to make it sound a wee bit more like their favorite artists and, mm. somebody, and so you'll end up with conflicting musical cliches whereas you've got quite a clear vision for for what you want to a point yeah you know I, I, or more, I'm, I'm better at knowing what i don't want which is i don't want <laughs> other people's musical cliches coming in you know um that instantly makes us sound like you know tom petty or that instantly makes us sound like we're trying to be the cure or something yeah. like that it's like no you know good bands but that's not us you know and and that's that's been the constant battle and that can really niggle at people too if they're trying if they've finally got the courage up to put forward an idea and i just say sorry that's straight off that album you know it's um so yeah you know it's, it's tricky yeah. the um the doco um i think i said to julia the director when she was in that the very first scene with the new and we can say this because it's in the shorts as well about you've been given a 30 percent chance of death so I guess you could say a seventy percent chance of life, which may be a nice way of saying that. Yeah. But a thirty percent chance you'll die was very um, confronting at the start. Well, just to clarify that too, it's thirty percent chance of being dead within the next six to twelve months, which basically meant hundred percent chance of being dead within like two to three years. You know, if if you didn't stop what you what are you doing? It wasn't just. It so was, it basically was a, a death sentence if you didn't address it. Yeah. And and the death sentence is. You got a one in three chance it's going to be only six months. Yeah, yeah. The, the thirty was just sort of that it could be much sooner than you thought than we thought it was going to be. Wow. Well, okay. Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't aware that's how I, I mean I guess I interpret it as you know a one in three chance that if you didn't change things would be bad. But you're saying if you didn't change it was guaranteed to be bad. It just depends on the time. The one in three was the timeline, not the outcome. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. That's heavy. So yeah. tell us about that. I mean, you can see your emotion in the film, but you've basically just been told. I guess that means you've kind of been told you've got two years to live if you don't, if you don't sort yourself out, and you've got a thirty percent chance it's only going to be three to six months. Yeah, basically. I mean, it could have been three or four years. Either way, it was just yeah. like there was a, it was a real, I, you know, I'd sort of held that at bay. I knew that I was making myself sicker and sicker, um, but the reality of actually having that put in front of you, especially with, I mean, I'd always thought if I was told that, it'd be like. You've got two years, you know, mm. which is time enough to sort your fears. But being told that there's a strong possibility you've only got six months, it was like, I can't, you know, I can't cope with um, trying to sort out friends and family relations, relationships, um, you know, get everybody sort of used to the idea of me dying and sort out all this mess. And um, so it was, yeah, it was a, that was not the best day of my life. And, um, it's important to say that wasn't set up. That was not mm. what we expected to happen when we went in. For what that. were you expecting? At worst, another one of those kind of warnings, Martin. You've yeah. really got to start taking this yeah. a bit more seriously. You know, somewhere down the line, you're going to get really sick. You know? Because I think that's what Julia did say as well: is that you've had several of those kind of conversations. Yeah. They come on. It's time to start sorting yourself out. But this was the first time you'd heard you're going to die. Yeah. And this was already having. Um, well, I came off the methadone program and all sort of other related drugs. Oh God, it's eight, nine, ten years ago now. I think it's it's a long it's a long while back. So, you know, I, I kind of thought I'd give myself, um, you know, a bit more breathing space by doing that yeah. and to drink, keep drinking alcohol. Yeah. But, um, it so was, was it uh, the alcohol? Is that the main the drug that was that gave you the one in three? 
Uh, like what, what were the things that led you to be in that state? Yeah, well, alcohol is the worst one, but the hepatitis having damage my liver meant that, you know, it wasn't just like a normal person drinking alcohol. My liver was already struggling just right. to do its daily functions, 250 or something functions it does. And me hammering it with the alcohol meant it was just, no, just no way. So um, I'm never getting back that 80% of my liver that's that's gone, you know. It's right. just, um, so it's seeing what the other 20 can do and for how long, but yeah. But what are the health like today? Like if you're going for a checkup today, what are they saying? Um, well, we're still finding out because 20 years of having that disease means we're not quite sure what my energy levels would be like now if I didn't have that. Right. And I've, I've become overweight. Part of that was doing the um, the treatment, gave me a real sweet tooth, and I was told, watch out for the sweet tooth. I, <laughs> I didn't. Um, so we're still finding out. But generally, my energy levels are much better. There's um, because, because I'm no longer being daily poison with toxins that my liver can't cope with I'm thinking straighter I'm you know able to kind of deal with band issues and planning much more you know much better than I was uh, which is a relief for management and record companies actually having me talking sense um, and be able to plan you know that's been another part of the problem they everyone knew how sick I was mm. and it's it's hard to commit to an artist when you're really not sure if you can book a tour for them six months ahead for overseas yeah if they're going to suddenly uh, turn up dead, <laughs> yeah. If you're, if you had have um, made that that leap out of that, you know, bottom third of artists into the top two thirds when the cutoff came, so you'd been kept on by Warner's, you'd gone through and you'd getting gotten more, um, you know, financial success, uh, music success, etc., etc., etc. And as we see uh, in many uh, musicians. You might have had more access and worse access to drugs and alcohol, and it might end up being putting your your health in even a worse worse spot. So, do you look back thinking with what you've already been through? Do you have a do you have any regrets that you wish you had of made it bigger, or do you look at it and go, if I had have made it bigger, imagine the shit I would have been exposed to? Okay, well, that's, that's a big question. It's a good one, too, because, okay, when when we've toured the States in particular recently, and, and Europe, I've, we've done that twice in the last five years, I'm coming across artists that I really respect who I did not realise just absolutely love the chills and really value my material. So one of the aspects of having, if, if time had been different, we'd stayed on, I would have interacted with um, a, a much broader and better category of of fellow artists um to quite a high level i think from the from what i'm understanding now and that would have changed everything even through that there would have been enough people saying martin don't go down that road you know that, right. could, that could have been one factor because these people know more about it um i got myself a pretty heavy cocaine problem doing the soft bomb album in los angeles so the other side is yes my, my tendency was to kind of explore these things and then come back to New Zealand knowing that I couldn't get hold of it, so yeah. you know I, I was going to be safe. So you're right; I could have had real problems, but at the same time, there were you know people who had a lot of friends die who who may very well have said, "No, just knock it on the head. If you're either going to be a serious musician, you know, career-wise, or you do that, and you see where that's going." Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, remember exactly that time is, is when Kurt Cobain and someone died and really started bringing the whole um, focus on on the, the industry chain and really pulled itself together quite a lot after a number of those deaths um, it, is, it was no longer acceptable it was no longer romantic to you know for the dying young um, the 27 club yeah and, and yeah and around that sort of thing Jace Google who's in the 27 club because oh. Cobain's in there oh, this Amy hits. Winehouse is in there yeah. So Amy Winehouse is probably your most recent sort of tragic. Oh, you know, well, there's been other ones. If oh, there you go. Jim Morrison. Yeah. Otis, Hendrix. Otis Redding was, wasn't he, I think? I'm not sure. So the, for people who are listening, the 27 Club is um, people, rock and roll stars particularly, who died at the age of 27, and it's an unfathomable amount uh, Janice, let me just go slow there, Jace. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, Janice Joplin, Gavin Moore, Jim Morrison. I'm Brian, just reading some of the bigger names. Brian Jones. Yep. Keep scrolling down, bro. 
Oh, David Alexander from the Stooges. Yeah. So, 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 so many of Chris them. Chris Bell, big star. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure Amy Winehouse was the, is she the last, scroll to the bottom, see if she's the last addition to a very long list. Well, maybe, was she, tw- maybe she wasn't. I thought she was. Oh, it's not in any order. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I mean, I love the, oh, no, it's not in any order. Okay, so I thought it was, I thought it would have been in there. Yep, she's only one. Oh, it's probably after And there's been right. good talk about why this is the case, and I think they're right that, um, people have gotten to music in their teens or early 20s that's generally the stage they're reaching where it's kind of like either the fun's gone or people have moved on from them or it's kind of you know the pressure is coming down to Mm -hmm. reinvent themselves or something um or they've had their their, as you say they've had their kind of like i mean i think about not that she's involved with this so let's make that clear but i think about the brook phrases and the lords of this world who who were doing music when they were 15 and 16 and those were their massive hits at the start of their career and then they're like well how do I write like a 15 year old again and then they have that pressure and I'm not obviously those guys didn't go that way but for a gen uh, you know an artist who's had their big breakthrough they've made their massive splash and they go crap what do I do now yeah and it's also family time you know a lot of they look around and see a lot of their friends actually really start to enjoy raising kids and stuff Mm -hmm. and the the reality that that that's well they can't do it or it's unlikely you know that, that I think weighs more heavily on people's minds was there you realize, also sorry you go well you, you realise you've traded off you know what the, it's it's no longer just the fun thing you started this is a, has become a serious right. life choice I'm not just an artiste anymore I, I, I'm a commercial venture yeah yeah was is uh, like you often sometimes hear with musicians as well that they um, you know they get to maybe second album syndrome or sixth album syndrome and they go I need to take I need to make take mushrooms or LSD to to write the new sound. I need to, I need to find the new sound, and to find that new sound, I need to go on a trip. And so I need those drugs to make me be more creative. The, the, I imagine that that's that's kind of a part of it a little bit, like when in that stage in that world as well, is it? I'd say I'd say so. I personally I don't think the um, hallucinogenics for creative stimulation are the uh, kind of prove fatal for many people, but I think it's more the kind of now I've got to get back out on the road. Do two hundred shows this year, and I'm going to have to maintain myself with and know, I'm up, uppers. And I'm, then yeah, I'm up drinking all night, partying yeah. with my fans and my and my groupies, and I feel like shit in the morning. So I better take something to get my energy levels back yeah, up. And yeah. there's your cocaine or your speed or your eight ball or whatever it is. Yeah, and then I do need to sleep. So and I'm absolutely wired. It's three in the morning, so I have a quick shot of smack and knock mm. myself out for a few hours. That's that's what's claim most of those people, you know. So. So yeah. in other words, drugs to get you up, but then also drugs to put you down so you can sleep. Not not literally put you down, you know what I mean? To yeah. uh, to help you sleep. Drugs yeah. to help you wake up, drugs to help you function, then drugs to help you sleep. And there's the cycle of... That goes, I mean, Judy Garland, that was what did her in too, and that was absolutely under the under the watch of her management, record company and everybody. And that's, that's the problem. That's what I was saying about the sort of shift in consciousness is everybody was watching that, that happen and... You know, around the late 80s, early 90s, there was a bit of a shift. It was like, hey, you know, I think, I'm sure it was money-driven that they suddenly saw the threat of lawyers getting involved. Yep. You people actually knew what was going on. Um, right. And otherwise they wouldn't have cared, but, you know. Do you have an opinion, therefore, you know, we're going through this thing, as many countries are, with legalisation thing around marijuana and cannabis and that kind of stuff. I mean, you've been someone who physically has had a you know, detrimental life due to some drugs and alcohol, what do you think about the decriminalisation of marijuana? Do you think it's harmful, not harmful, no big deal, should be taken more seriously? I think we're facing well over a century of misinformation about it now, which will make it very hard for a, for a public to vote knowledgeably about it. Right. And um, meaning, meaning people have, have said it's a lot worse than it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. people have grown up, you know, I mean, it's... Historically, it's not that long ago. It was you had photo, um, you know, movie posters of people injecting marijuana, the de- you know, the devil's <laughs> drug, and and it turns out surprisingly, it wasn't so much the um, alcohol tobacco companies who are financing that. Although Reef they did, madness. it was um, it was also uh, what's the name um, the media magnate who didn't who realised this business about the cannabis crop being a much better paper paper maker than his forests were. Oh, so, the hemp. Yeah, uh, yeah. Making, making, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, anyway, so, I, yeah, I believe it's, it shouldn't be a legal issue. It should be a health issue. It should be education. And that's, um, and, yeah, there, there's going to be people, there's going to be some awful mistakes made. There are going to be people dying and people say, well, this is what's happened. 
but it, it's a it's a transition that needs to be made where suddenly it's realized you know the sheer hypocrisy of trying to say it's a health issue when people are allowed to advertise stacked carbohydrate and fat burgers on tv nightly in front of you and don't you dare tell us you're telling us that you know marijuana is a health issue when there's everything on tv is sugar and fat and interesting yeah, yeah. well didn't, wasn't that something recent um i could be wrong maybe it may, may have been through or they're trying to get through but i think labor was trying to um, or have just passed something where if police now come across um, somebody under the influence or with drugs sort of thing, they up to a certain limit, it's now long, no longer deemed criminal, it's actually a health issue. So if they find somebody under the influence, yeah. instead of throwing them in jail, they'll take them to a, a clinic or a hospital. No, I mean, not quite that black and white, but um, they are treating people with addictions as, instead of being treated as criminals, they've been treated as people with an addiction or with problems with drugs, and so they get taken to hospital. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good start, although obviously I think very quickly the, the facilities for dealing with these people aren't there, you know, so that's, a, I think, that's I the think, other trouble. I think the idea of medicinal cannabis as well, we had the New Zealand Film Festival a couple of weeks ago, and so we had a uh, documentary maker who did the Helen Kelly um, documentary, and Tony is notorious and you know watching her towards the end of her life saying legalize my cannabis and the government saying no it's like okay come on at least to, from my perspective I mean medicinal marijuana medicinal cannabis CBD that kind of stuff done should be done right and then if people need it the doctor prescribes it like like far more serious drugs they prescribe now and from there I think that's what happened in California about mid 90s they they had um, they legalized medicinal and then that actually gave them the data they needed to have the conversation around decriminalizing all of it so I, I mean I don't know what the question is going to be at the next election but I hope it's I hope it's got to do with decriminalizing of of medicinal marijuana yeah well that, I mean that that should have been done years ago and and also this whole thing there's been enough serious research and papers done proving that the big pharma pharmaceutical companies are maintaining disease they're not trying to cure it because the money is there and so you know again sort of you know how do you you can't you can't trust them so oh i don't know it's going to get very complicated so, well it's like yeah. it's like in this day and age they talk about you know back in the 50s 60s 70s whatever it was it was pretty easy to change your cars um spark plugs and change all yourself at home whereas now you kind of can't do that because everything's electric and it's almost like there's an inbuilt uh time period that that car will last because of course the manufacturers force. want you to yeah, want, want your car to, yeah they want you they want your car to break down because then you buy more car yeah so just like the if you're if you're a if you have a wonder drug that you know stop someone having the flu then of course you want millions of people to have the flu yeah. so you can make money yeah yeah, well, that's, that's the was yeah, forced obsolescence, and yeah, it's a big thing within electronics. Obviously, you know, you just look you have to look at your your phone to realise that it starts to get slow after a few years, and then it stops working properly, and so you have to go buy a new one because they want you to buy a new one. If they they, they could quite easily make one that lasts for a long. You know, look at the old Nokia. You know, twenty years ago, the technology was there to make the Nokia three three fifteen, and that thing. You know, these stories of them being dug out of the ground with still 50% charge on a battery, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, encased in concrete. You know, the technology was there. Underneath, <laughs> un underneath dinosaur bones. Underneath that's dinosaur how bones, exactly how old they are and how good they were back then. But they well, just, remember, you know, there was, it used to be a common phrase in ads on TV in the probably 80s or even 70s, a spin-off from the NASA space program. You know, it was kind of like the technology has now reached you. And the fact that phone screens still break when you drop them, I just don't buy that for a second, you know. <laughs> I think somewhere on, on something that's been sent to space, there was some glass that would not break. You yeah, know? yeah. And, um, and it probably could be made quite cheaply now. So the, the best one I ever remember about those is there was a certain pen, and it was like this was invented by NASA to be able to um, use in, in zero G. Right, so you didn't need gravity for it to work, and so they talked about. So you could write upside down with this pen, and of course, um, the Russians came out and they explained that they just used pencils, 
<laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's actually, right. That, so that, there's that, that there is pencils. actually um, a, an urban legend. Graphite pencil. Um, this the so the, there's two parts of the story. Graphite is actually really dangerous to have on a spacecraft craft because the, the 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 graphite and the pencil can short out electrics. Um, it wasn't developed by and it wasn't developed by NASA. It was developed by the Fisher Pen Company. Yeah. Um, they did spend millions of dollars developing it, but it was private funding. The Fisher Pen Company developed the Space Pen. I own two of them, actually, so I know about them. Um, <laughs> it's quite, really, quite passionate about this, isn't it? Because they're really good pens. Um, and the Russians also used them. So the Russians didn't nice. take pencils. So the Russians actually bought the Fisher Space Pen. And the, so NASA used it. And the Russians also used it because, yeah, it does write in zero-G. And it's actually a really great pen. Um, but yeah. I prefer my story, even if it's not It really. is a much cooler story, absolutely. Yeah. But it's not the truth. It is a cool story. It's is fake it, news. It's, oh, hang on. Um, it is okay enough okay enough sure, it sure. is pretty cool but this is pretty cool as well this is uh, an award you guys got at South by Southwest that's right so for people who don't know South by Southwest a massive uh, media music arts kind of uh, what do you call it um, expose kind of thing festival um, expose festival. it has, has live gigs it, has, it shows movies it yeah. has expos all sorts of stuff based in Austin, in Austin Texas it's Austin, an an, annual event and hundreds of thousands of people come in from around the world now for it um, the chills went there in what March I think and at the end of an American tour so we were absolutely on fire which is good the movie, the Chills movie was premier. They had the world premiere there, and mm. two other screenings got really good response. We played eight times. Um, there's something like two thousand musical acts happened happen during that time. Rolling Stone magazine said the Chills basically dominated South by Southwest cool. 2019, which is like, thank you. And there was there was an incredible buzz about the band. Um, so yeah, that was really good. And then. Uh, the Grulka Prize. I've looked. Brent Grulka was one of the creative directors of South by Southwest, and they set up a prize for, I think this is something like developing acts, American developing acts, international and career act, which is basically like quick, give them something before they die kind of. Kind of award. <laughs> so yeah, we got we got. Um, is that me over there? Yeah. Yeah. So we got this lovely wee thing. That's the that's the South by Southwest arrow symbol. There you go. There's the there's the lads. The Chills dominated South by Southwest 2019. The documentary entitled "The Chills: The Triumph of Travel Apart" premiered on March 12th. The Chills supported the film with a series of shows, beginning with a concert the Tuesday prior to the start of the music portion of South by Southwest, and concluding on Sunday when a good portion of the conference goers headed home. Cool. So that was yeah, that was good. Um, you know, it's it's nice to be. <laughs> It's nice to be recognised. So when um, this happens, um, and you're in the hub, you're in Austin, Texas. Um, do you uh, are you then approached by numerous American agents and things saying, "Hey, hey, let's do something." Uh, well, yeah, there's been a lot. There's been ongoing talk about what what this will lead to. Yeah. Um, it's uh, more <laughs> more complicated than than you'd think because yeah, it's just it's just complicated with agencies with how much our legendary status actually translates into um you know ticket sales it's 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 really tricky so yeah we're, we're not sure. name drop a bit for us you're talking about the acts before the big acts that kind of came up to you when you're on your tour and said that you know what your music and stuff meant to them like who well like who and could you connect yourself with them? I mean, you guys have been around probably too long to be an opening act, but if you were a build with some other acts in America and tour sort of thing, is that a possibility? Yeah, it's one we look at quite a lot. Is is there's pros and cons to this supporting a bigger act tour kind of thing? It's, yep. it puts you in front of a um, a re, you know a really good audience, a good audience, um, but they're not your audience. Yeah, and but. Yeah, so there's been talk of like the Pixies, you know, at least oh, a couple wow. of the Pixies um, are big Chills fans, um, but then I don't know if anything's coming out of that. Um, REM were big fans and they've been wow. touring touring again. They, they actually helped us quite a bit. I, I've now realised with our whole signing to Warners, I think they were kind of, you know, sort of, that was their time at yep. Warners. So, you know, they are mostly older acts. Oh, actually, no, that's not true. I mean, there's a lot of young... But REM's still huge. 
Yeah, uh, they're one of the bands that gets, that's debated online a lot about. I, you know, I spoke to these kids the other day and they'd never heard of them and right. that kind of thing. Um, the, same, the same with the Pixies. Though. Pixies are all not, maybe not a, a household name, but you know they're they're just as huge, not just as huge as REM, but you know they've, they've got a, a cult following as just like any other big band would be. You know, there's diehard Pixies fans out there, so you know. Yeah, totally. So I mean, that's that's the kind of band I'm talking about. That that. Um, well, we knew about those ones, but there are other other bands, other artists that I'm just surprised. Um, odd, yeah, odd things come back. Somebody was a friend of Bruce Springsteen's and found that he had Submarine Bells album. He'd, he'd been thrashing that. This was like oh. years ago. Just so I don't know. These wee things come back. He suddenly realised it's actually a much smaller world than than you realise it was. That there are people in the music industry who obviously will know this person because they they work with them every few months and. And they said, oh, have you heard that the chill from New Zealand? You might really like it, you know. Do so that's been going on for 30 years now, and of course that's really spread. So, Do you yeah. think, for you personally, do you think you'd rather have Bruce Springsteen thrash your album or 10,000 people thrash your album? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, I don't I don't diss Bruce Springsteen like some people do, because I think at the end of the day... Oh, it was more just you know, a, a, yeah. a big name, like you know, knowing that the Pixies oh, see, knowing okay, the RM, gotcha. you know, A big name you, or a big audience. Would you rather have the professional... Would you rather have the, the admiration of your peers or the admiration of millions of fans, sort of thing, I guess, is more the, the crux of the question. You know, it's not even a simple question because <laughs> if we're talking about well, those fans actually st- are they just like fly by night kind of like trendies who are going to abandon you a couple of years because they just picked up on one song they like then then bugger it no they can piss off I'll, I'll stick with the people who actually really know and can see the quality of what we're doing and and you know we'll speak about it so that's, that's probably me with a lot of bands I'm that guy that gets that one song yeah. <laughs> and then the, I'm a huge fan of this band but I know one song of them or something but yeah yeah Hey, speaking of Spotify, this is a question I've always wanted to ask an artist, right? If Jace goes to Spotify right now and brings up the Chills, don't put it on the screen yet, Jace, brings up the Chills page, do you know what the top five songs will be? One, two, three, four, five? Or can you have a bit of a guess? Oh, well, it's going to be prob- yeah, Heavenly Pop Hit and Pink Frost alternate. All right. So it's, it's usually those two... Um, then it gets kind of actually more weird than you think it would. There's, it should be, in theory, Love and Leather Jacket, maybe Rolling Moon. Um, but then we find things like Warm Waveform off two albums back suddenly creeps in there. It, Let's uh, have a look, Jase. Can we have um, a look at the top five? I call it, like, this is right now. Does you know this change around the world? Like, would the top five of all sitting in Los Angeles for the Chills page be different from the top five? Like, is there a different algorithm for New Zealand? I, think, I think so. There yeah, is. I think, you, I think you can find an international one as well. Right. But, but I think what we see here is... I probably should have asked you. Have you got Spotify? Can we have a look what it is? So what's the top five? Oh, yeah. So Pink Frost, Heavenly Pop, I love it. So you said Lovely Leather Jacket. Yeah. What's Pink Frost 13? Is it like a remake? Uh, yeah, we did, we did a, we were playing quite differently and recorded it as a B-side uh, just before, two albums back, just before Silver Bullets in Kaleidoscope World. So if you had, um, oh, if you had the opportunity to just play one more song for the rest of your life, forget why the reason we're being silly. You could only pick one. What would you pick? Well, Pink Frost, because I mean, Imagine having to play some bloody novelty song all the time, but Pink Frost is still an absolute joy to play live. It's yep. got a great atmosphere to be part of when it when it cranks up. Um, and Heavenly Pop It is basically hard work. It's, it's a really powerful song, but it's also really demanding. It's me singing at the top of my range right, right through. Blah, right. blah, 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 blah. And um, Leather Jacket, you know, it was of its time. It's great glam, thrashy thing, but... But Pink Frost is a really special atmosphere. So, looking at the um, at the banner at the top here, is this the current band? Ne- no, it's not. No, because <laughs> well, for a start, it doesn't have Erica. That she's she's in that photo, but she's been chopped off. Right. Um, and James at the end has just has just left the band. Um, we've just had we've just got in Callum Hampton now. Uh, Let's hear a little bit of something while we chat, Jace. Can just be underneath us if it gets us kicked off YouTube. So be it. But this is I, I, now. So I was going to ask as well. Who who owns Pink Frost? Do you own Pink Frost? Does the label own Pink Frost? Who who owns the actual song? You know, like the, your back catalogue. Do you own it? Would the labels own them? I I own the songs. You know that I wrote. Yep. And in that case, Terry Moore, uh, the bass player, owns a bit of it because of some of these the two intro parts. Um, this is still with 
Mushroom Publishing, I think, and Flying Nun. Um, some of the latest stuff is with uh, Warner Brothers still. The most recent albums are with Fire Records in England. So if you, because you had a six album deal with Warner Brothers, but when they quote unquote drop you, harsh word, I'm sorry, um, does, it, does that all go away? Or like if you make an album today, are you still, do they oh, no, still have no. rights to it? No, I see what you mean. No, it was kind of, they had the, they had the option for continuing down and getting new chills albums and they chose not to continue their option so right that's, okay. that's, that's, that finishes it give yeah. us a little bit of heavenly pop hit because i have to say for me this is part of my you know formative years just even that and not you know like it's that's so recognizable yeah and the video was shot in ireland not oh, really not, not new zealand those people think because we went out of our way to find we were rehearsing for the world tour there and um, scouted around to find New Zealand-like scenery. So yeah, which actually wasn't that hard in uh, in Ireland, Southern Ireland. Yeah, good music video. There's too. a goat that turns up somewhere in this video. <laughs> There's a wild goat that was wandering around the set, just out of the blue. Yeah, nearly, nearly got coaxed onto the bus. I don't know why people were trying to coax a goat onto a bus. And what stays on oh, tour? Yeah. What it, happens it, on it, tour stays on tour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I nearly got washed off that rock. <laughs> Seriously, when, when we arrived there, they'd scouted out the day before. I, I was the first to look over the cliff face. Yeah. And the first thing I see is this whopping wave go over the rock. So we, I see that rock. I just watch go underwater. And they, and we watched for another ten minutes. No big waves. So I went down there and did my singing, and it was kind of like a few takes. Right, cut. We got that, and I turned around and into the bay came in this wave and I just said there's no way I could have got back up fast fast enough so I said just film and I waved my arms around and this thing came up right up to my sort of above my knees nearly washed me off a rock did it make the cut I'm trying to scan through I'm not, I'm not sure if that's I don't think it did I think that actually sort of like wound down their cameras no. and it was kind of <laughs> yeah. yeah looking back on it obviously there's a lot of a lot of your life which many would see as yeah, you know, I mean, as you see in the documentary, sort of um, heavy and maybe even some people might think it's slightly sad. I'm not saying that it is fear or anything, but you must have had some pretty amazing experiences as well. I mean, even the story you just tell now about making that that video, I'm it's it's something that I just kind of that's, it sounds like you've had an amazing um, journey so far. Oh, was, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. I wouldn't, despite the ups and downs, and we were the long dark period during the sort of you know the 2000 early 2000s late 90s i wouldn't change any of it really because it's brought us to where we are now and so you I, are a product today of the past you've lived and you're happy with the product today meaning you personally yeah yeah i think there's there's a, a depth to it and, a, and an understanding of people people's ability to fall into and rise out of dark situations that mm -hmm. I would not have had if I hadn't been through it myself. And obviously that means my next question is a ridiculous question. Would you change anything if you could? Because you've just said the person you are today is because of all the experiences you've had. But looking back on it, is there anything you kind of think, well, I would tweak that or I would tweak that. Is there any little things along the way? Or if you could have some knowledge passed back yeah. to the person, is there any little things that you kind of go, mm, what would have happened if I could have... ABC. Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, I've been, I've been asked the what would you tell your 25-year-old self question. That's a much more professional and, way of saying it than what yeah. I just said. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, I would trade off this knowledge of the darker areas because I wasted so much time yep. down there for me going back in time saying, Martin, it turns out you were not immune to drug addiction, as, <laughs> as you kind of think. At that time, I'd tried everything, and I thought, you know, that was how it was going to be. I yep. didn't realise that your brain doesn't forget that there's a button you can turn on that makes you feel good when you get into a dark space. Um, it's fine when you're powering along and things are going well, but then when you get dark, you've still got that knowledge that you yeah. can just go off and take something. <clears throat> and so if I could warn myself, yeah, you know, feel free to do a wee bit of tabling, check out the major drug groups, but be very, very careful because no, it's going to, you know, it's going to detract from your ability to create do you um, do you still have to be aware of that today? I mean, forget heroin or anything serious, but you know, do you have to watch yourself with coffee? Could you become a coffee addict? Do you have to watch yourself with caffeine? Do you have to watch yourself with, I don't know, maybe it is with um, television stuff that all of a sudden you can sit there for seven hours because 
an addictive personality can do those kinds of things? Is it something to be aware of? Yeah, yeah I think I'll, I'll always have to watch out. Um, luckily, I've avoided caffeine because uh, I think now if I, if I spoke to a therapist, they'd say it's because you got quite severely burnt by a boiling water jug for or so when I was about four years old. Right, wow. And I just have avo- avoided tea and coffee for um, most of my young adult life and then I started seeing the impact of caffeine on people actually having migraines when they couldn't get it so quite happy to do without that um, smoked probably all of one packet of cigarettes over my adolescence never went back to that um, but yeah the, the, as I said that knowledge that you can uh, fundamentally alter your state of mind on the spot was something you can't unlearn that so I've got to be careful I mean I can't I would never you know, not that you're comparing, I would never put my story up against yours for addictions, but, you know, I've had my fair share of struggles with various um, addictive things, and I remember sitting with someone once talking about it um, who was trained in that area and who, who was also had addiction issues, and she said very clearly, and I really like this, I think about this a lot, that her addiction is always in the car park doing press-ups. Right. In other words, it's always right there, it doesn't go away, it's still in there and it's doing press ups, meaning it's getting, it's staying strong to try and, you know, find a space where it can maybe creep back in again and, and so sort of take over. It might seem a bit dramatic, but I love that, that vision of, you know, my addictions in the car park doing press ups. Be yeah. aware. Yeah. Look out for it. Strange triggers. I, I woke up um, a bit earlier than I normally would now. Um, not not long ago, and thought, why am I feeling so excited? What's happening today? And I realised, well, nothing is. But this is a time you used to wake up on a certain day of the week when you knew you were about to go out and score some drugs. Wow. And, and and even though it's too early for that, this is where you'd be getting up and you'd be starting to already get your um, syringes and everything in order in, in anticipation. Wow. And that's nearly a decade. That's over a decade now. Wow. Back and I suddenly realised, wow, that's still just waiting there, you know. And and it got me thinking. Um, so if I did follow that through, do I know anybody these days? And I was like, no, you don't. And that's really... So you're saying you're just playing the game in your head, you weren't actually thinking about it seriously? You can't yeah, go, if, 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 if I wanted to, could I? Yeah, I was thinking, if, if that's still really trying to drive me, yeah. do I actually have the means of fully, um, seeing that through? Luckily, no. I've so actually, even though the addiction is doing press-ups, actually, there's, there's no, to follow the analogy, there's actually no gym to work out in. There's nowhere to, to, for those press-ups to matter. No, but say say I go through say a whole series of dark things happen in my life, and I'm thinking I really do want to try that again. I don't think it would be an insurmountable problem to go out and, and use the links of links of links to find my yeah. way back into that scene. It's, it wouldn't be that hard. So it's not impossible, but it's not like as easy as it once was. No, exactly. No, and the trouble is now I do have a bit of a uh, hometown celebrity status mm. where. People would love to be able to say, "Guess who I just scored some drugs for?" You know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Do you um, find that like you go and play, are you getting offered? I mean, like I would imagine we had um, we had a young rapper in the other day, and he was showing us his Tinder account, and he was doing it on screen. He was going swipe, 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 because he has a lot of profile at the moment because he's just done a song with Snoop Dogg, and um, things get thrown at him. I mean, when you're out in a bar. Be it, um, is it called Refuel, the one that used to be at the university? Has it changed it's, their names? Uh, well, it's still there. I'm okay. Not sure, yeah. You know, down there, are you getting, here's a beer, here's a beer, here's a beer sort of thing thrown at you? Well, luckily, no, not not often. Um, and very quickly, you know, to say, most people will take, no, I don't drink anymore. Oh, fine. What Can I get you a, you know, lemon lime bitters? Yep. Um, very occasionally, it's usually more when you're out in small towns or a rural area. Oh come on! You can have one. They will go down that route. Yeah. You know, it's just, the word hasn't quite got out about how right. serious a thing that is to do to somebody. But um, generally, no. But people are actually pretty pretty educated oh, cool. now about about that. I guess the documentary has helped, and certainly this documentary must have given you a bit of a, a bump in um, you know the public eyes on you. Are you finding that you know post the documentary, a few more offers coming in to come and play at this space and that space? There's been a bit of that. There's been a. Um, a lot of strangers dropping me to say thank you for the movie they really enjoyed it um because of one particular scene i've had two complete strangers stop me in the street offering to, uh, to tell me how to cook an omelette properly <laughs> because there's a i mean it was I, I can cook well but there was the one day they got me to try and prepare something uh, it was a mess 
and so everyone thinks oh poor Martin I need to tell him how to <laughs> how to do a proper omelette so uh yeah no there's it's it, the ramifications will be I think there for the rest of my life and uh you know bands like Dandy Warhol's Brian Jonestown massacre who had that movie about their kind of you know supposed feud um that altered the tra- trajectory of both their careers forever and it's still being discovered by, by people I think 20 years later or something so that's what that's what's going to happen with this because it's it's a powerful movie that is uh, going to keep finding other people not just through the band history but through the kind of it's being used now as um, a tool on hepatitis C oh, wow. awareness and um, yeah just different aspects to it so it's it's good I remember when um, we had Julian to chat about the doco, she said that when she brought the, I think she brought the name to you and you wanted to change the words around, I think she said that you had, you really wanted to be the triumph and the tragedy and triumph of Martin Phillips. And then she was like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we all agreed that nobody would go and see that movie. Because it's kind of ruining, it's ruining the end in the title. It says, yeah, yeah he survived, it's okay. You yeah, know. exactly. <laughs> With so much change in the band and with so much you know coming and going of... of you know the other members of the band why still the chills why aren't you just performing as martin phillips um when our drummer martin bull died in 83 uh we briefly thought we'll leave we'll leave the name the chills with him and became a wrinkle in time named after a children's science fiction book for one weekend and everyone called us the chills anyway (laughs) um since then i realized that these people have all worked hard to establish a basically a brand name, you know, a, a, and it would be really foolish to abandon that now. It doesn't matter how good solo stuff I would do, uh, it would ne- you get a third of the interest that you do in a band because right. there's something about it that people dislike that concept. Um, because, um, what was it? It was, yeah, um, uh, she had, you know, after after nine eleven, they, 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 they changed the name to Pacifier. They went to US, and it was like, you know, you, you see interviews with John Too Good, and he's just like, is John Too Good? Am I getting confused with that old broadcaster? So when it's Salon Too Good, John, yeah, so John Too Good, he was saying, you know, it was like the biggest mistake of the band's thing, changing their name and trying to make the US market at the same time. Yeah. It's just like, you know, so it's, it's it's a brand, yeah, 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 and you know, you're acknowledging that's one thing that came out in the movie as well is despite. Uh, the odd bit of antagonism in the past or you know, misunderstandings all the people approached were really proud of being part of it and um, you know they put some solid years of their young life into establishing this thing so I don't want to do that I, what I did try for a while when I started doing more regular solo stuff was having Martin Phillips and Martin Phillips and the Chills to indicate the band were an entity in their own right, right. right to be respected that completely backfired too because it made it actually sound more like I had, to, had a pickup band, you right. know. So, um, so yeah, we got rid of that. There was the Sunburn album in '96 was Martin Phillips and the Chills, and now I know we should never have done that. But uh, yeah. so, where to from here? You're basically saying your health is is okay. It's, there's still some unanswered questions, but obviously you didn't you didn't die. It's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and every every tour subsequently, particularly the American one, was. Um, has proven that I can not just manage it, my voice is better than it's been probably in 20, 25 years, I think. And um, so now, yeah, we just it's it's choosing from the offers and trying to be very strategic about what we do with our energy and our limited time as a band. Because as I said, everyone's got jobs. Yeah, we're not at that position where we where they can throw them in, and um, you know we'd we'd like to step up to the international festival circuit where you can actually do three months of festivals and live the rest of the year is that um, still the dream like if you could wave your magic wand that that you'd be living comfortably off music and music alone and you'd have a full-time band with you like the chills would yeah. be full-time yeah that, that would be, that's what we sort of need to aim at or we've got serious questions about um the the scraping together of funds every time we try and set, mm. set foot outside the country is just just ridiculous so there's more pressure on me to go out and do solo gigs uh, internationally, but I can do probably less than a third of my uh, of the Chills catalogue solo, and I don't believe it really kind of um, 
it, it doesn't really promote the chill side of things at all. Yeah. It's it's almost a different crowd. It's a, it's the a people who, who want to sit down and experience with me as a songwriter and not the same people who want to come out and rock to the chills. Yeah, there's a crossover, but not, not, not as much as you think. Right. So, um, yeah, a lot of questions at the moment. And even people in the industry that we're talking to really are kind of throwing their hands in the air saying, I could four years ago, I could have told you what to do with social media. Now, I really don't know, you know. And it's become so fundamentally important even to get um, accepted on a festival. They, they won't look at your legacy at all. They'll just check at Spotify. No, you know. Really? Yeah, just like that. Number of plays, Number not of plays. enough. No yeah. thanks. Yeah. Wow. And it's done that quickly. So that means really investing a lot financially as well into social media and just getting on top of that. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, it's yeah. kind of it's kind of weird. We're in a position where uh, the band is being acclaimed as one of the kind of surprising success stories that, that you know, to actually come back with quality music is, is much more rare than you'd kind of, you know, assume. There are a lot of bands reforming, but to actually have music that people say is uh, the equal of past, you know, different, but equal, the band is firing on all cylinders, we're not getting up there kind of like grinding out a few hits mm -hmm. and looking at our watches. Um, all you know, really good acclaim, great reviews. Um, New York Times, The Guardians, kind of thing. BBC uh, wants to do a proper in depth interview with me, apparently, radio, all the stuff. And it doesn't amount to anything in terms of like sales or um, getting across to a bigger audience. So, and that's the difference with media and the media exposure. I mean, again, not not comparing, but you know, this is similar to what we're doing. You get you get more well known and that big audience can bring you perhaps some financial reward, but that process of becoming more well known, whether it's on the BBC or whatever, is not necessarily the way to earn money. It's the byproduct of growing beyond that thanks to that. Yeah, and to a large degree it's become that the kind of media I was talking about is an old person's media too so we may connect with a percentage of our older fans but yep. not not with the young ones that we need who are actually actively going out uh, we, we'd be very lucky that you are getting strangely a, a lot of younger people starting to turn up who have seen their favorite artists re referencing us um, yeah. but how you actually like really tap into that is another maze well i guess yeah. this is probably a good time to uh, just remind people of the documentary because you're talking about funding and funds and that kind of stuff, so a few sales of this would be good. Uh, I love the quote on the front by Rolling Stone, this is what a living legend looks and sounds like. It's a pretty good quote. That's good, isn't it? Very yes. good. Hey, well, Martin Phillip from The Chills, thank you for coming in and joining us in this crazy little thing we call the Department of Conversation. Our little hour and a half is up. It's a bit of a time tardis. This, it just flies through. Yep. Um, but yeah, people want to know more about you. I know The Chills are on Facebook. Yep. as just The Chills and I guess notable films have got a um, The Chills film uh, Facebook page up there I think we've been putting the Chiron up for this and we Jace we've been putting up there that the, how they can get, get through and get through you don't really do a lot of social media a public social media thing yourself you leave it up to sort of The Chills but to be the public face of social media um, I, I mean, have, you I, are on Facebook I, but I, not I, as a public entity yeah, I have, yeah I have been doing the odd bit particularly when I'm on tour and but I need to get better at it. I really do. And, and Instagram, Instagram, obviously, we're sort of um, going to get much more active with that. Cause yeah, Jace is right on the what's coming up. So what's coming up for gigs um, is there is a sold-out gig in uh, Christchurch, August 30th. You are in Auckland? Yeah, uh, there should be. Yeah, we've got... So Thursday, Christchurch sold out. Some people are still, you know, swapping ring tickets online. You may find one. 30th, Others Way, Auckland, and then the next night... It should be Wellington. All right. Uh, so if people want to find out more, is it is it best to go to your uh, website or honestly or to Facebook to find out what's going on? Uh, yeah, uh, well. Either or. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, well, I'm see not... Facebook's right there. So facebook.com yeah. forward slash the chills. Very yeah. easy to find. It's on our uh, Facebook page. Well, there's links there. So cool. people can find it. But thanks for coming in. Thank you. No, this is good. It's been a blast. And um, we will watch you... I kind of I don't want to be patronising. I want to make that really clear because you've had so much success, but it feels like for your next wave of success, it's like there's another wave coming, and I and I hope to be able to watch that and see what comes of it for yourself personally and the chill. That's amazing. 
Same here. Oh, and one thing I was going to mention too, yeah. this this award thingy came with $10,000 American that has to be donated to a charity of our choice. Oh. It's taken a wee bit more organising than uh, we expected because the American funding had to recognise the New Zealand charity. But yep. there's going to be an announcement pretty soon about where that's actually going. You don't want but, to do like breaking an announcement on... On the show at all, because you'd be welcome to, wouldn't you, Jace? If if I knew it was hundred percent see it, <laughs> okay, then, then I would. But um, <laughs> make sure you let us know because we'll definitely Facebook that and put it out there and stuff when it comes out as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, Martin Phillip from the Shells. Thank you, sir. Thank you.